Tashi. They're like, well, razors, Rinchen and Dada here. Let's watch Happiness When the Chocolate Runs Out with mm. Rubina Corton. Mm. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> How would you describe Rubina? Robust. <laughs> <laughs> and very, yeah, energetic and just ready to slap you in the face. <laughs> yeah, with her wisdom. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, she's a fantastic Tibetan Buddhist nun. Mm. Uh, I met her a few times. Um, and I listened to hours and hours and hours of talks. I might have actually listened to this talk a while back, too. Mm. Um, yeah, she is uh, straightforward to the point, very fast in speaking. Try to, Try keep to stay up. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> But most importantly, enjoy and leave some happy emojis in the comment section because this um, is a talk uh, from the Happiness and Its Cause conference, mm -hmm. which is uh, very beautiful. Yeah, we need more of that in the world, so exactly. give it a like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been very nice to hear people talking, Gretchen and Robert, and things that Robert was saying, very pertinent to what I want to say, actually. So the terms he used, you know, positive and negative emotions, Buddha completely would agree. This is exactly how Buddha talks. <laughs> and what's interesting also is His Holiness referred yesterday to these Indians, you know. And I remember hearing him recently say it was these Indians, these Hindus actually, these amazing think masters, thinkers, scientific, mm. you know, thinkers who more than 3,000 years ago were the ones who really investigate, who began this extraordinary investigation into the nature of self, you know. Mm -hmm. And somehow... That's, and so that's what's informed the Buddhist teachings. Buddha came out of that amazing tradition mm -hmm. and then diverged yes. in his own direction, particularly in relation to the fi his own direct experiential findings about this self, mm -hmm. about how things exist. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting also, His Holiness mentioned this model of the mind, you know, the, the one that's come from the Indians. That's also the basis of all the, 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 the study that goes on in the Tibetan monastic university system, which is the system that I've been educated in, to some extent, um, that's studied, you know, and. And I think it's kind of interesting because the way we think of it, when we think mind in the West, we, of course, we think brain, and there's nothing wrong with that, mm. but the Buddha would be very clear in saying, <laughs> your mind is not the brain. And so the, the, yeah. the investigation for the Buddhist is an internal one. Mm. You don't need to use a microscope. If you were asked one of these amazing meditators, these you know, marvelous beings sitting up in their caves the last 50, 60 years in, in Tibet, um, where their brain is, they'd have no idea. <laughs> and they certainly know their minds. And so, yeah. But at the same time, His Holiness, as we all know, has been doing this incredible investigation <laughs> and communication with thinkers, Western thinkers, mm -hmm. the last, or, you know, the modern thinkers, the last 30, 40 years about these topics, and we can find incredible um, meeting points. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to be talking from the Buddhist perspective, but we're going to see it's very familiar. It's not as if Buddha owns this stuff, he's not a creator. He's observed it. Nice. He's observed every word that I'm saying here, even though it's in colloquial Australian, <laughs> it's coming from <laughs> these extraordinary great thinkers, first the Indians and then the, uh, and through the tradition for me of the Tibetans. Check this last, talk. you know, Perfect. thousands of years. Yeah. It's nice so when they acknowledge this positive that. negative, right. sounds at simple points, you know. Hmm. But this, this, is, this is the basis of actually Buddha's model, Buddha's way of describing the contents of this mental consciousness of ours. And the, the question, of course, is, is the, the point. What do you do when you don't get what you want? Hmm. What do you do when the bad things happen? <laughs> and this, this, is, this really mm. is the, the fundamental point that's assumed in the Buddhist model. Um, the contents of our mind for the Buddha, the mental consciousness, and they point here, you know, the, the, the Tibetans certainly point here. Mm. The, the contents of our mind, Buddha divides into three categories. It's like a deceptively simple way of dividing our, the contents of our mind. They use the terms positive, negative, and neutral. And these are like technical terms. Hmm. Neutral refer to all those ones we all need, they're like the mechanics of the mind. Remember, I'm not talking about the brain. Like concentration and remembering what to do and identifying this from that. There's many, many of these parts of the mind that whether you're a meditator or a murderer, they have to work well for you to do your job properly. Hmm. So they're neither <laughs> virtuous nor non-virtuous. Mm -hmm. They're neither positive nor negative. We've got masses of those. Mm -hmm. But the key ones that if you want to use the Buddha's model and Buddha's methods in your mind of, to be your own therapist as... Lama Yeshi would put it, mm. knowing your own is knowing your own thoughts and feelings and emotions. You know that's the stuff. And so the stuff that we need to look into are the ones that are called positive and negative. And initially, it's deceptive. 
these terms seem so cute, you know, <laughs> but the implication of these in Buddhist psychology is really profound, and the intricacy and the precision that's um, used to identify these different states of mind. So if we're not talking about the brain, how do you investigate these? Well, I mean, the best we can talk often in our culture is we talk about knowing what, it, what we feel. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting in the Buddhist model, once you've, say, developed these um, practical techniques called concentration meditation, this marvellous psychological technique, actually, you know, that came from these incredible mm -hmm. Indians, they, they were the ones who came up with this extraordinary technique mm -hmm. that's the basis of what we Shamata. call these days mindfulness meditation, the variations that are around in the West. <laughs> You, you learn this technique, which is simply a concentration technique. It's not holy. I mean, a communist can do it very well, you know. Got no religious overtones whatsoever. So it's, it's a practical skill that enables you to focus your mind, not be all over the place, you know. So that with that focus, which is not enough, you then need to have this, if you're a Buddhist, or using the Buddhist model, you need to have the understanding of the contents of your mind, the, kind of the basic description of what you're going to be observing. And this is where you have to learn this skill of distinguishing between the so-called positive and negative. So Robert's point is brilliant. You know, you need the discomfort. We need, the, the, we, need to have con we need to have access to the unhappy ones, not to sort of push them away or live in denial of them. That's plain foolish. <laughs> And this is the point, in our culture, um, we either vomit all out our bad feelings, and that's called <laughs> anger, you know, and yeah. I'm very good at that one. I've done personal research since I'm born. I know that one intimately and well. <laughs> you vomit out what you feel when things go wrong, <laughs> or you suppress and you deny. And they're about almost the only two options we have. But this option here, this one of having some focus, understanding the bare bones of the Buddhist model, and that means clearly what is a negative state, what are its characteristics precisely, <laughs> and what are a what's a positive one. Precisely what are its techniques? And this is a crucial element in Buddhist psychology. And the long term, of course, for the Buddha is that these negative ones are adventitious, as they say. Well, you need a dictionary for that. We don't, I mean, I don't use it in my daily life. Adventitious <laughs> means that these are not at the core of our being. And this is the basis of all of the Buddha's techniques, which is a, an outrageous concept. To think that attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem are not at the core of your being and the Buddha's finding being that you can get rid of these. Mm -hmm. If one of you is a therapist out there and I come and ask you to give me some techniques to get rid of all anger, all jealousy, all fear, all attachment, all low self-esteem, and develop infinite love and compassion for all beings all the time, you would think I'm mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> but this is precisely totally, what Buddha is yeah. saying. This is what he means by nirvana, or some place like heaven, you know? So the key to knowing and understanding this is to understand how these feelings, as we call them, these feelings, you know, um, are based in based in being conceptual, based in, in, informed by conceptual stories. So in other words, all the, the, these negative states of mind, attached, starting with attachment, which is the one that desperately wants the chocolate not to run out, <laughs> and then when it, has, when it does run out, it has a panic attack, and that's what, give, that's what then gives rise to what's called aversion, the strong <laughs> aspect of which is anger. And this is an amazing concept, actually. You know, that anger, one way of defining almost what, it, what anger is, is anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. Mm. Once we understand this and the other states of mind, and there are many mentioned, of course, once we really become familiar with how these states of mind function, then we can identify them. And then we can start to argue with them because they're conceptual stories, and that's what's surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, me, as, a, as I said, I've got expert, I have deep, deep knowledge of anger. Since I'm born, it was like, hmm. you know, my mother didn't have to teach me. I knew it well. <laughs> so once I understand that, I understood, you know, the Buddhist view that that's the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. That's the one to focus on, and that's the one that's hard to see. This attachment, this word is so cute, you know. We use it in many ways, and in our culture, we would use it almost synonymously with. Um, closeness or love or affection mm. and this is mm -hmm. why you know and this initially this is surprising to us too we know that we need to be precise and clear and accurate in our definitions if we're talking even about how to make a chocolate cake mm. if you don't know what a teaspoon is you're in trouble you'll make a mess you know? <laughs> so the same precision and clarity is what the Buddha would demand we use you know to investigate this mind of ours, these thoughts these feelings this is the key to success and this is of course the Buddha for the Buddha the key to happiness in the simplest sense you could say for the Buddha, happiness. For us, basically he's saying, and that's the kind of happiness they mentioned yesterday, I forget those Greek words, related to hedonistic, I think. That one, you know, the good feeling, feeling good. Um, the, 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 the way we in our world think of happiness, which is when you get, when you get the chocolate, 
which is basically what we think is what you get when attachment gets what it wants. And that for the Buddha, this attachment, is this default mode that's so, 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 so deeply ingrained, so primordial within us, we don't even notice it until it doesn't get what it wants. Mm. This is the trick, you know, it's so hard. And so to, using these techniques, we have to learn to be able to observe this, this attachment and really it's multifaceted as far as Buddha's concerned. It's this, um, almost the first level of it, the energetic level of attachment is this intense sense of dissatisfaction. And we can see we're born with this, you know. Deeply, mm. a deep feeling and assumption, which we think is the absolute truth, that I'm not enough, that I don't have enough, that no matter what I get, it's never enough, and it's just this constant feeling. Therefore, naturally, if there's dissatisfaction, the next level of attachment is you hanker after something. This fault, this sense that you haven't got enough means there's something missing. So, we, and where do we first look? Where do we first hanker? Obviously, the objects of the senses. We're these sensory beings, you know, we're embodied sensory beings. So we look out there for the five sense objects. And depending on the ones we've got connection with, we will continually be searching without in, even intellectually understanding it, constantly waiting for something to grab us. And then the assumption, which is again of attachment, another function is the assumption. Well, first of all, no, this attachment, when it gets that object, like the chocolate cake, it'll make the chocolate cake look really delicious. We don't think <laughs> that we're making the cake look delicious. This is a shock to us. We think the cake is delicious. <laughs> so whatever's in your mind, Whatever appears to you out there is seen in the aspect of what's in your mind. So if you've got attachment, this neediness, this expectation, this dissatisfaction, deeply instinctive. You walk along being a normal person here, not looking like a junkie. <laughs> this is normal attachment. It's working constantly underneath. Then the eyes see that shape and colour. You interpret it as chocolate cake and all the story starts. And before you know it, the hand is there and it's going in the mouth. <laughs> this hole. We know it's not that hole. We're deeply trained. And then the assumption is that when I get it, I'll get happy. So the assumption we have of happiness is what you get when attachment gets what it wants. Mm -hmm. So naturally, that, that determines all the things we do, even if we're nice people as well. You know, we've got, this is, we're talking the negative states now, which is a difficult word to hear because it sounds like punitive, it sounds negative, it sounds moralistic, but it's not meant to be. It's a technical term to understand these states of mind. And why they're so hard to see is because they come along with what we call the positive ones. Love, compassion, empathy, kindness, generosity. We all know these as well. But the trouble is they come together mixed like a big soup, you know? <laughs> so this is why we need these focusing <laughs> techniques. We need to have this basic knowledge of this model so I can then begin to observe the conceptual stories, the assumptions that feed my emotions. And the trouble is we only, ha we only notice, like I said before, you know, I'd only know I was angry when my attachment didn't get what it wanted. So, you know, we, we might, you know, you and me might go and have a piece of chocolate cake. Oh, let's have chocolate cake. We look like we're happy. We enjoy chocolate cake. <laughs> But look what happens when carrot cake comes instead. <laughs> <laughs> you might go, oh, I can handle carrot cake, that's cool, and you proceed to enjoy. Mm. I will go, excuse me, I ordered chocolate cake and get upset. Mm. That's the proof mm -hmm. that I had this assumption of attachment, which is this dissatisfaction, this constant manipulation to get what I want, this making the thing look more delicious than it really is and building up a story in my mind that it is more delicious than it really is and then the absolute expectation that when I get it, it will bring me what my attachment believes. Hmm. And the, what the Buddha is saying is all of this, they're stinking rotten lies, but they're so deeply ingrained in us, we can't identify until we start going deep inside because hmm. they're, so, they're so automatic. We don't, even, we don't even think they're conceptual. It seems like a joke to think it's a conceptual thought, you know? But they're conceptual at a very subtle level. And we need to get into that level and begin to see these assumptions. And then when you change those assumptions, naturally then you train yourself to see that it's an assumption and a neediness and an expectation and an exaggeration of the deliciousness and you start to change that story. You do this cognitive therapy in your own head. You argue with yourself. Your, your, your positive ones argue with the negative stories and you get to see logically how they're not an accurate story. You don't put yourself down for it. You don't feel guilty. Oh, I shouldn't feel this. You hear the stories. You're very rational and clear about it. And this is hard work, you know. Then you literally change your assumption about the cake. You change your definition of it. You change your view of it. So when you do get the carrot cake, you can also go, oh, that's cool, I can handle carrot cake. <laughs> so I can say over the years, I don't have many so-called realizations, as they say in Buddhism, you know. Sure. But this job, yeah. I have enthusiasm for it. <laughs> I can see to some extent that I've done yeah. it, it works. So I can say without question, the things that would have made me completely crazy, angry, literally don't now. Not because I'm sort of, no, not because of a miracle, not because I'm such a genius or such a deep yogi, 
because I've changed my interpretation of things, changed the way I interpret the world. And that's one way of saying really what you're doing, being a Buddhist or a communist or whatever you are. You know, it's a series of philosophical views about how things exist. So this is the level to which, if you try to use Buddhism, you do it at this, um, you try to do it at this level of changing your assumptions. You know, Buddhist psychology is kind of hidden to the world, as for mentioning it's coming from the Hindus, that's really a, a, a shock to us. Even mm. most Indians, as His Holiness says, mm. don't know the remarkable background mm. from their great yogis over the centuries. Mm. You know? And even most people oh, who yeah. think or, or even practice Buddhism, we don't go into the mind in great depth. But this is the key, actually. Mm of using the Buddha's skills, not looking like a holy person in my 14th century Tibetan robes, not having a bald head, <laughs> not doing prostrations and holy things and saying prayers, you know. The, the bottom line is if you're using these techniques that come from the Buddha, which are these rational, clear, mm -hmm. focusing, hard, disciplined techniques to enable you to know the contents of your mind, mm -hmm. not with a microscope on the brain, but with a microscope of your mind, knowing your thoughts, knowing what they are. So Robert's point about, you know, almost like another way of putting it, embracing the things that trigger your unhappy feelings, the discomfort, as he said. This is marvelous. We've got to greet these things, but we've got to have a clear view of what they are, you know? Welcoming your anger and welcoming your jealousy and welcoming the fears doesn't mean you're sort of patting them on the head and saying it's okay. You've got to know how they cause you suffering. But like knowing that certain food will bring you belly aches, you've got to know it. Not guilty. Guilt is meaningless. Guilt is useless. Guilt is just ego. Mm -hmm. But having this clear understanding of your mind, knowing what causes, knowing all the different thoughts, unraveling them, and recognizing really clearly the ones that cause you pain. So when we, you know, we usually with moralistic stuff, we we tend to have guilt, you know, and I think that's our view of morality. Our view of morality is doing something that someone else said. Immorality is doing something that someone else shouldn't do. Like I'm in my house with my mummy, she says, don't do that, but I'm a little. I guarantee you when I say why not, that she will say because I say so. Hmm. And that's our view of morality. And not criticizing, but that's also the, the, the creator religious view. I asked a Jesuit priest friend of mine, do these people warn me of my time or something? Hmm. Nothing yet, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 24, 23 what? What's that mean, please? <laughs> they didn't tell me. What's 2018 mean? Is that all I've got left? Oh my gosh, I better stop then. <laughs> I just thought I got started. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Time flies. It looks like I have to stop. Okay. Hmm. That's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rubina. Bravo. What did you want to talk about at the end? She was oh. just going to tell a story about her. Jesuit priest. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh the friend. creator. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, just maybe showing the, maybe pointing out a contradiction between, you know, how we're seeking, you know, happiness in, you know, different paths, whereas in Buddhism, it's all about, you know, you mm. got to examine your own mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. And go within and then, yeah, dissect that. So absolutely, yeah, I love the talk. <laughs> I love her talks, actually. They're always super entertaining. Yeah. Because the... Me. <laughs> talk just flows out of her and it's so you know fast. and she's there present you know oh, yeah. sharing from experience and yeah i love it so the, <laughs> and then going back to the cake because she's mentioned that story a few times i think that's her go-to yeah. in regards to the attachment we see the cake it's going to make me happy and you're projecting happiness onto it and then i want it and then when i get it i'll be happy but if i don't get it then i won't be happy and that's just a story in the mind right yeah. so really and i think that's really the you know the true ultimate value of the buddha's teachings is that even he put the teachings above himself right it's the dharma and that it's about the mind right so i love how she touched on that is mm -hmm. that you can do prostrations you can go to the temple mm -hmm. you can you know meditate you can do pilgrimage you can do all of these things but ultimately, it's the mind that you got to examine and look into and then see that, yeah, those lower levels, the lower states of anger, jealousy, attachment, you know, spite, misery, and all of that, it's, you know, it's a product of our conditioned mind and mm -hmm. it can be, you know, purified and let go of because ultimately, you know, there's a Buddha nature, there's a clear light mind, there's a pure beingness that's free of all defilements. And that's our true nature. Mm -hmm. That's the Buddha nature. And I love how she also touched on it. The Buddha was 
a Hindu, right? He oh. had access to all those. What are the chances that I click on a video where she actually starts off with that? Yeah, that's amazing because, because oh, to wow. be honest, that's kind of rare in my mind, you know, amongst, well, I guess the teachers, the true teachers who know the teachings, you know, they all understand that. But amongst like Buddhist communities of just like lay practitioners, not really diving into it as deep as maybe some of the teachers have, you know, there is that misconception. And then they don't want to acknowledge that Buddhism mm -hmm. technically is a part of Sanatana Dharma, right? Mm -hmm. That's where its roots are, because the teachings are so incredibly similar, especially when you get into oh. the Upanishads and what the Buddha taught are pretty similar. The only real difference in my mind that I see is just the use of the names, mm. right? Whereas the Buddha is not using Brahman so much. He's using, you know, consciousness, mind, right? The substance of everything. So, mm. yeah, fascinating. So mm. I love that, see what, seeing the similarities, you know, and the closeness of the truth, right? There's one absolute mm -hmm. ultimate truth, and then there's many paths. Buddhism is, of course, a valid path, but also other paths are valid as well. Yeah. It's all about <clears throat> seeking the truth within. Can you touch on uh, mind training that she kept mentioning? Yeah. And explain it briefly. Yeah, so mind training <laughs> is basically about, you know, analyzing the mind and actually focusing and seeing how it works. Okay, how does my mind think how does it respond to a trigger when somebody says this what is pops in my mind when i see somebody like that you know what arises is it jealousy and this and that and it's really about you know getting a clear indication of what is going on in your mind right and then the training aspect comes from that awareness so just being aware of the processes of your mind allows you to work with it and say no, 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 I do not want to react that way when this happens. So then how do I purify that? And then you focus on your mind on that. And there's many techniques within, you know, Tibetan Buddhism. There's books on mind training. Yeah, yeah. I've read a few of them. Of course you did. Yeah. So nice. it's all coming from being aware of who we truly are, right? Mm. So the Atman, the Buddha nature, the Christ consciousness, Krishna consciousness, whatever word you use to describe the true innermost essence of who you are, that's what it's all about, right? Nice. The non-dual nature of reality, the source, the oneness. So that's what we are seeking. And if you are seeking that as well, thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely love her talks. If you like them as mm -hmm. much as we did, uh, you know what to do. Uh, <laughs> and let us know in the comments section. Um, and do you battle with these? Do you want the cake? <laughs> right. Want to shovel it in? <laughs> shovel it in. If you don't get the cake, is your anger? Because I feel you. I've, I get that way sometimes still. And that's mm. part of the mm. part of what's going on. But anyways, absolutely love mm -hmm. you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, raise yourself. And raise the world. Mm. Thank you so much, everyone. Omani Padme Peace. Mm.